So today we're going to talk about cultivating 100% kindness in our lives and how we do that and why it's hard and why it's really, really important. Um, a few years ago I wrote a book called Tantric Intimacy and when I was writing it I was I really wanted to get a flavor of why anyone would ever want to study Tantra. Like, what's the why? What's the thing that would make this really important? Or what, what, did, what really had to be in the book? And so I actually, my kids were, um, I guess, older teenagers by that time. So their friends were all off at school or working or at university or whatever. So I pulled their friends and other people I knew who were of that age, you know, 20 to 30, and I pulled them and I asked them, why would you ever want to study Tantra? And, you know, and of course some of them said, oh, all the great sex or just to have a new experience. But they all said, but really, you know, kind of once the joking ended, they all said, because I genu genuinely want to experience love and real connection with another person. And that's something that has been lacking in our world. It's been lacking for millennia. You know, I mean, every so often you find people that really have that genuine, open-hearted, easy, loving connection. It does happen. You know, we all probably know a couple people like that or a couple or a couple here and there. But it's extremely uncommon. And this idea of 100% kindness is the foundation of really being able to experience any kind of love, any kind of connection. So first I want to talk about what kindness means. Kindness is not being a doormat. It's not just doing what other people want. It's not keeping the peace. It's not just going along, you know. It's simply how we treat another person. If we're having a bad day, do we take it out on other people? Does that person pay for our bad day? If I'm tired, do I treat another person differently? I'm allowed to be angry. I'm allowed to be frustrated. I'm allowed to be sad. I'm allowed to be all kinds of things. But those are my emotions. What I do with them, I can feel them. I, can, I don't have to suppress anything. I don't have to be happy all the time. But what do I do with that? If I'm sad, do I make sure the whole room is sad? Do I make sure that everyone else is suffering like me? Or do I put it on them to fix me? If I'm angry, do I feel like it's okay to just sort of take an emotional Uzi shotgun and just take everybody out? You know, if I'm frustrated, is that all anyone's going to talk about tonight? <laughs> you know? This is kindness. It's this, and what's really interesting about kindness is, in one of my courses about tantric intimacy, the fir one of the first questions I ask in the homework, and this was really, really interesting to me, which is why this topic is such a passion for me. And I used to ask the students, I would say, do you believe that 100% kindness is possible? And I thought this was a given. I thought I was asking kind of a rhetorical question. And at least half the time, they would say, no. Not only do I say no, I think that's dumb. <laughs> I don't even think it's a worthy goal. It was deemed boring. Where would the excitement be? Where would the sparks be? You know, where's the makeup sex if you're not fighting? You know, everything was sort of it was almost like the norm was combat. The norm was distance, battle, and then have sort of battle type passion sex or something. And there was just no possibility that this, like that there was no idea and I couldn't believe it. I just, so then I thought, well, maybe I need to redefine what I mean by kindness. Like, why would you ever not want to be kind to someone? Why, why would you actually intentionally know that you're going to be mean to this person you've chosen among seven and a half billion people on the planet. Like, 
why would we ever choose to be unkind to this person? Ahead of time, like premeditated. (laughs) It was really, really bizarre to me. And, And I think there's a lot of factors there. I think a lot of people, like again, we've come out of very, very difficult times. The last few centuries, the last millennia, have not been utopia, right? There's been a lot of cruelty and a lot of power over and a lot of separation and a lot of us versus them. There's been a lot of real difficulty. And that's like right within relationships and right within us as people. We have a lot of combat inside of us that we then bring out into our relationships, especially with our loved ones. So on many levels, we almost don't believe it's possible. We think it's kind of like a unicorn concept. You know, it's not not real. That's like Mr. Rogers or some weird thing you see in a movie, but that's no one actually lives like that, right? You know? And and of course this this sort of thing is such a challenge. It's such a challenge in relationships. You know, because without that hundred percent kindness you do not have connection. There will always be walls. There will always be guards up. You know, in previous talks, we've talked a lot about the idea of safety. How do you have safety in relationships? What does that look like? What does that feel like? This is, this is the foundation of what safety is. To be able to be completely open, to drop our guards, to be completely present and allow love to flow between us, right? But as soon as we're not sure if the other person is going to be kind, how much can we really share? How much is gonna come back in sarcasm on a bad day? How much is gonna come back while we're making love in just sort of a snide remark? You know, this is really, really important. Because all it takes is one act of unkindness and an energetic wall must go up. It's not an incorrect adaptation. This is a correct adaptation if there is unkindness. The same way if you were physically hit, you would put your arms up because you're kind of waiting for the next blow, right? Or if, when I was a teenager, I used to take Taekwondo and you know, of course we would have to practice taking shots to the gut right and so you'd learn how to tense your stomach so that you could take it so you're basically living in a state of constant tension right we adapt to it you know we find all kinds of ways to numb the pain right we find all kinds of ways to try to get around the guards try to figure it out but the bottom line is There are guards up between us. And unfortunately, it's 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 not like a hundred percent. That's not it. It's on the one hand, it kind of is a hundred percent. Right? There is a difference between the door being open and the door being shut. Right? There may be grades of that, like you could maybe open a little and you share a little bit of yourself, but how deep could you possibly go? Maybe you share a little bit more. But again, if there's any risk, because people would often say to me, well, what if I was like 95% kind? You know, that's like saying I only hit you once a month, right? It's like, oh, well, most of the time I'm really, really nice. But you know, once in a while. So you never know when the once in a while is coming. So you have to keep a guard up all the time. And this is a really, really big deal because it's almost like as a human we know deep down that actual flowing love actual open-hearted vulnerable love is possible we know it even if we've never experienced it even if we've never experienced unconditional love we know deep down that it's real we know that it's possible so we forever feel like we're missing out so like let's say you're in a relationship and your partner or you, maybe you're like 60% kind. Maybe you're 70% kind. 
Maybe you're 10% kind. <laughs> we stay together in very curious ways. You know, maybe we stay together for other reasons. Maybe it's, say, it's, uh, it's convenient. It's a roof over our head. It's whatever. You know, we just don't want to be alone. So we put up with all kinds of stuff, right? It's like, oh, well, maybe they're not open to being open, right? So you just sort of, you know, you just figure other things out. We're very, we're survivors. <laughs> like, we'll figure out other ways. But there is a sadness that happens inside of us. There's this thing inside that says, no, more is possible. I know more is possible. And you almost, you don't want to lose that hope. You don't want to lose the possibility that we could make it happen. So now all of a sudden you've got this sort of weird power struggle and it's like, how come you're saying stuff like that? Why do you treat me? What are you saying? What are you talking about? And it just becomes this sort of battle, right? And eventually one person just gives up and says, well, it's just not possible. And then this loneliness seeps in, like this real feeling of separation, this real feeling of, and then we take it personally. We assume it's us. We assume there must be something wrong with me. Maybe no one would ever want to love me. No one, maybe no one would ever want to be close to me, right? It really, this lack of kindness, this lack, I swear, if we could, if we could really cultivate 100% kindness in all of our relationships, I feel like most psychological problems would just disappear. The things we think are wrong with us, the things we struggle with so desperately, they would just disappear. You know, even the idea of being with someone and they say, you know, I'm only doing this because I love you. Like, that's awful. And that includes, that includes partners, that includes parents to children, that includes friends, all of it. You know, we really have to redefine what love means. You know, love doesn't mean, well, I'm kind of attracted to you and I kind of like hanging out with you and having sex once in a while. That's not love. That could be anybody. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not that. It's not open-hearted love and, and we miss that. And it's so, so, so important to just being human. It's almost like the, the life force that flows through us. And this doesn't require us to have a partner or anything, what I'm talking about. We're going to talk about what that looks like and how love builds on top of that 100% kindness. And whether we're in a partnership or we have people around, and we're also going to talk about what it means to have that all within us. Because that's really what you know brings the happiness, that brings us peace, and then we can actually share that with others. The other challenge when we don't have that, we're going to talk, it's very depressing talking about the lack of, lack of connection, but I'm just going to talk about it for a couple more minutes. One of the challenges is when we are in a relationship like that, and, I, and this can be anything, this could be with our parents, with children, with friends, with lovers, with everything, right? When there isn't kindness, when there isn't 100% kindness, so many dark things rise. Suddenly you get together out of obligation, right? Because you don't actually feel a connection with this person. Your soul doesn't want to go there. Your heart doesn't want to go there. Your inner child sure as hell doesn't want to go there. So now you have to impose obligations on people to make them do things that they don't want to do. <laughs> There's no need for anything like that. I remember when when my mom was dying, she, uh, so I have two sisters and we were all married and then there was my dad and she was in, she was in the hospital for like three years and the seven of us would literally sit around her bed every possible moment we had. Like there was nowhere else in the world we could ever have been except right by her bed. And I remember someone coming to visit once and they said to her something like, well, that's good. They feel that they should be here for you or something like that. And I remember us all just looking at her like, what are you talking about? We're not here out of obligation. How, how could we not be here? Like it's not even, a, it was pure love. It was just pure connection. 
There was no, my mom was probably the kindest person I've ever met, I've ever known, you know. And, you know, so we had to be there. So there's no obligation where there's love because there's connection. My teacher, Jim, he used to, that's how we actually said, he actually defined love as connection. So if there's no connection, it's not love. And that's a really interesting distinction. You know, that even if we do something to someone, if we say something to someone and it causes a step back, that's not loving. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what story we're telling ourselves as to why we're doing it or what philosophical perception we're coming from. It isn't loving and it causes this and it can keep causing that if we're not careful. The other challenge, of course, especially in intimate relationships, is that when we don't have that kindness in our life, even our sex life can only go so far. It's like, you know, you might be able to sort of have that physical animal orgasm thing, maybe, right? I saw a quote once that said, 25% of women had never experienced an orgasm, right? It requires a woman to be, have to really relax and be comfortable with herself and be with a partner who is willing to care, like actually connect with that. And, you know, that's a really big deal. So what happens if you're with someone long term and all you really do is sort of have this animalistic sex? But you can't, even in this first and second chakra connection, you cannot open and be vulnerable, right? It's going to get boring after a while. You really just sort of co-masturbate. You just, like, what's really going to happen? You've got to juice it up with all other kinds of things because there's actually no magic flowing between you with that the intimacy is actually building upon. So, anyway, this is what we're going to talk about today. So I want to talk about love. I want to talk about the different... I remember when I, was, when I was writing this book, it was interesting to talk about Tantra, but what was most interesting to me was, why is it that we struggle so much with connection? Why do we struggle with... Because the thing about Tantra is that you want to be able to connect your infinite self with your physical self and if we apply that to relationships, we then bring that infinite self and our physical self and we join with another. And now we have this incredible infinite experience together, which is just a whole nother thing, which I think is sort of what draws people to Tantra because they see these pictures of people, you know, sitting in Yabyum and all this energy is like flying up, like through them like this. And you're like, yeah, that's what I want. Because deep down, we know that's real. Deep down, we know what are they, our human potential is. And yet, it seldom would happen. You know, in all the retreats I would go to, and I would talk to people and students of Tantra, and they're like, well, we're working through this, and we're working through that, but you know, it just never got there. And so then I realized that the first section of the book actually had to be about love. It had to be about exactly what we're talking about right now. Because if we can't open ourselves completely to another person, nothing can flow, right? It's almost like if, if we want energy to flow between us, the channel has to be open. So the, in the ancient Greek, they had many, many words for love. It's funny how we've sort of simplified love into one word. And love in our world can mean anything. It can mean commitment, <laughs> which has nothing to do with love. It can mean abuse. It can mean jealousy. It can mean control. It can mean fixing. It can mean so many things that aren't even remotely loving. So it's, it's really lovely to kind of go back to the ancient Greek. They had beautiful concepts for what it was to be human. So at the foundation the Greeks had something they called agape. And agape is basically, it's interpreted many ways. In one way they say, 
it's God's love for humanity, or it's looking at each other through the eyes of God. And what that means on a really practical level is it means total trust, um, not trust, it means total respect and kindness. And this is a really big deal. Like if we were to kind of look at humanity from a bird's eye view, what you would see is a whole pile of humans really trying their best. Each person on their own journey, however you understand why we're here or what we're doing here, whether you understand it through reincarnation and karma and Akashic records and ancestral DNA and epigenetics, however you understand every single person on this planet is on a journey. It may not look like ours. We may not understand their choices, but we don't understand what they're actually dealing with. Even they don't understand what they're dealing with. You know, we don't understand what we're dealing with. <laughs> Even to explain to someone else if we're struggling or we're happy or whatever, there's like, there's, there's probably practically 99% unsaid based on the little bit that we can say. So how could we ever understand what another person was dealing with and why they made the choices they made? And Agape says it is that feeling that if I was in their shoes, I would make the same choice. And it's really being humble enough to know that, that we really are all trying and we really all are playing in the same sandbox together, just trying to figure it out. So agape becomes this kind of invisible connection between every person. And this can include animals, it can include everybody, but it includes, it's this love. It's just this connection. If you imagine, it's just sort of knowing that, you know what, we're all in this together, trying to figure stuff out. We're all having a journey. We're all having an experience. I respect your journey. This is a huge deal. And it's easy to say, but this lack of agape in our world, in our families, in our relationships, is the foundation for nearly every single issue we have. Right? You imagine the difference if you have a partner and you don't respect them. And, and what I mean by that is you think you know better than they do. Right? You think you have, the, you have answers for them and you think they made bad choices. How's that person going to feel? Right? They'll know. I mean, no matter what our intention is, no matter what we think our intention is, with the message is loud and clear that you think you know better than I do. This isn't respectful. And what does that do? It brings us apart. Right? So now, what's possible if there's no respect? As opposed to someone doing something and the other person going, hmm, wow, rock on, you know, let's see where this goes. And not with a, not like, wow, well, let's see where this goes. It's like, hmm, you know, I remember even like when I first became a mom and I remember thinking, you know, I was 25 when my son was born and I remember thinking, what do I know about anything? What do I know about raising a child? What do I know about raising another human being? I'm only 25. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> like, no idea what I'm doing in my life. I don't mean about him. I mean, in my life, I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, I'm 51 right now. And who knows? Things are always changing and I'm learning and growing and getting migraines and <laughs> calling my friends, you know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. And so it's a really weird thing when we come to a place where we think that we have any idea what someone else should be doing, even our own children. It's a very, very strange, strange idea. And it's just not loving, right? So then all of a sudden, if you, let's say we assume respect and we assume we look at our, our friends and our lover and our children and our parents and we assume respect that, you know what? I know you're on a journey. I'm happy to walk, walk alongside, you know. 
then why would we be anything but kind? Right? Why would we, even if someone is mean, right? And again, here's where choice comes in. This is where kindness does not mean staying with someone if it's an unhealthy situation or staying with someone and you're unhappy. That's not kindness. Sometimes the kindest thing we can do is leave. Right? That when a relationship actually isn't allowing both people to thrive or grow, you know, if it's sometimes in an unhealthy relationship, one person maybe wants to be stagnant. For whatever reason, they're like, you know what? I don't want to learn. I don't want to grow. I don't want to change. This is me. Like it or lump it, right? And then the other person, if they choose to stay, also must choose stagnancy on some level. I mean, obviously, there's still lots you can do. But in the love department, you know, we're going to become stagnant. So is it kind to stay? Or is it kind to open a new chapter? We have a lot of weird attachment to things. We have a lot of weird in the land of those ideas that are hanging on the on the walls of our parents' living room. <laughs> all the till death do you part and you must and you made a promise and all these things. And you kind of go, yeah, but nobody's keeping their vows now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, Nobody's honoring and loving and cherishing and doing all these things. So what are we doing? What's going on here? Are either of us thriving? So it's really important in all the conversation of love to really bring in the reality of choice. Right? We haven't had choice historically. Choice is new, especially in relationships. It's actually amazing that even within the last hundred years, how much has changed in the land of choice. So to always insert choice at all times, to say, huh, so that's what you'd like in a relationship? Hmm. I don't think that's what I want. Actually, I'm pretty clear that's not what I want. Maybe we should, maybe we should separate. Not in meanness, not you're such a jerk, I can't believe you ruined my life, none of that stuff. It's like this is, this is the agape, that we respect another person's journey. And the other person doesn't want to do all the navel-gazing and introspection and meditation. They just don't want to. That's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. And then you say, huh, but I do. I really want to do this and this and this. And I kind of feel like we're just going to keep fighting. Hmm. You know what? Let's part ways and still love each other and just enjoy a different way of living, you know? From agape comes philia. Sometimes. Agape is something we can feel for anyone. Agape we can feel for strangers walking down the street or our boss or anybody, whether we like them or not. <laughs> we can still go, okay, I think you're a kook, but right on. <laughs> Like, we can do that. <laughs> Philia is a friend. Philia is someone who you trust, who for some reason, this person and you click, and you know they'll always have your back. And there's someone that you can share your deepest fears with, your thoughts, your concerns, and they'll listen, and you'll discuss it, and you'll go on road trips together, and you just... You're always there for each other. It's a different, again, it's not an obligation thing. It's a depth of connection, right? It's just of all the people in the world that we have agape with, oh, you and I, we, we kind of get along. That's awesome. And Philia is very beautiful because it's a, it's a place of sanctuary in the world, right? It's a place where we can be ourselves. You know, I remember one time someone said, that you can always tell how close you are to a friend based on how whether you clean the house before they come over. I know that sounds really dated for 2021, and it sounds also very gender-based because I'm a woman. But again, it's amazing how the world has shifted. But in my lifetime, I don't know what, I guess I was married 30 years ago. <laughs> At that time, a clean house was a reflection of a good wife or whatever. <laughs> these, these things hanging on my parents' walls. 
and and that was a really big deal and I even moved into a very old-fashioned farming community fundamentalist Christian very um, appearances were everything and um, anyway I do think it's an interesting thing it, but it's even your own self forget about houses you know how much do you present your real self to this person right how deep is that connection how messy are you willing to be in front of them and they still just love you they're like yeah yeah you're my favorite nut job awesome awesome you know want a coffee <laughs> you know? this is philia and now so imagine so we have agape and then every so often we find someone a friend and you can have philia with everybody you can have philia with your parents you can have philia with your children you can have philia with friends you can have philia with colleagues and you must have philia with your partner if you have a partner right this is, this is the foundation of actually allowing this real loving connection to happen. So on top of philia, with every so often you find someone who has that little something something. And there's more. There's more than just friendship here. There's eros. And eros is that romantic, passionate love. It's beyond philia. It's something else. You can't make it happen, and you can't get rid of it. <laughs> it's one of those, uh, you know, poets have been trying to describe why it's there and what it's all about for a long, long time. No one really understands it. But what's really beautiful is, I remember when I first, um, when I was first imagining these, these different kinds of love, I imagined it like a river between people. Right? That if we had agape, we had a we had a connection, right? We had maybe a riverbed with a nice trickling stream running between us. That there was something passing. If there's no agape, there's just a block. Right? It's just damned. <laughs> there's just a there's a block here. But imagine we have this beautiful agape stream between us, right? Awesome. And then we find someone, we go, hey. You're very trustworthy and awesome and I like talking to you and I like listening to you and I like hanging out with you you know let's be friends and then the river to bed gets a bit deeper and more water flows between us more love more connection more of that magic that really nourishes us flows between us and then Eros deepens it even more right this is where if you have agape philia and passionate love it can be like a raging river. If there's no guards up, it's literally like, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's. <laughs> I remember one time I was teaching Tantra in Sedona and, and the people I was staying with, they asked me what, <laughs> they said, I think they were just kidding. But what they said was, I would love to videotape you having sex. <laughs> Because, you know, because I get really passionate. If you ever heard me talk about tantric intimacy, I get, I get pretty animated. And I said, it doesn't look like anything. <laughs> like, it's not, it doesn't, it's not interesting. Like, from the outside, it doesn't look like anything at all. Because on the inside, you have this raging river of energy flowing between you. <laughs> Like, there are no walls, there are no guards, there are no dams. All you have is this crazy torrent of energy flying between you, circulating between you, and you're kind of just holding on for dear life the whole time. <laughs> In a really awesome way. But that is this amazing power. This is where you experience this. And, yeah, the raging river. So then, one of my daughter's friends, she's an artist, and I had this sense that this idea of agape and philia and eros was also, it also defined a relationship, like actually how a relationship worked. So I asked her to read some of the chapters that I'd written and about this river and all these kind of things, and I said, could you like draw me something? You know, and she's an amazing, 
um, artists are amazing to me. You know, in the thing in the in the world of, you know, everybody has different giftings. I'm a stick figure person at best, and anyway, artists blow my mind. I have so much respect. So she drew a tree. I'm just going to show you the tree she drew. It was called the tree of love. And agape was the roots, and philia is the trunk and the branches, and eros was the trees and the blossoms. And if you imagine looking at that, if you have 100% kindness, the roots stay intact. And what happens when there's unkindness? You just cut away at one of the roots. The tree doesn't fall over, the relationship doesn't end. And again, I'm talking about friendships, parents and children, partners, colleagues, bosses, everything. It doesn't end, but the tree gets a little sick. It doesn't get quite as much nourishment as it could have. And then something else happens, and then something else, and something else. And then all of a sudden there's not as many blossoms on the tree and some of the branches start to die. And bit by bit, eventually, the tree does die, falls over, whatever. And this is really, really important. This is why this 100% kindness is such a big deal. I think one of the great challenges in our society today and I, I wouldn't even, <laughs> you know that, that joke that, you know, when people say, did you know that 43.6% people just make up statistics on the fly? <laughs> so I have no idea what the statistic is. <laughs> but I have a sense. There are a lot of people in the world who have never felt unconditional love. They've never had a relationship where there was 100% kindness. It's just never happened, and it's not a, a fault of anybody. It's just the way it is. Like, it's, it's literally been so normalized that sarcasm, oh, what's a bit of sarcasm? Like, when I used to date and I would go on dating apps, and a guy would write, you know, sar love to be sarcastic or something, I'm like, swipe. <laughs> like, oh my God, no interest in that. It's like, we have normalized it to the point, even in Hollywood, everything, everything's based on just a lack of kindness, right? And the key is, so how do we do it? What do we do if we've never experienced this before? How do we cultivate it? How do we find it in relationships when maybe we've never even seen it? And therefore, we maybe don't really deeply believe that it exists. And it sounds really corny, but this is where we start with us, right? We start with self-love. And so we ask ourselves, do we have agape for us? And again, if we define love as connection, right? So our inner connection to self, what does your inner voice sound like? Is it nice? Is it kind? Most people I know, including me, have a pretty brutal inner voice some days. Pretty ruthless. And they kind of know exactly how to uh, get us where it hurts, right? And so this is really important. Like, do we have respect for our own journey? Do we believe that we've done the best job we can? Right? Or do we have a list of all the things we did wrong and all the places we screwed up and we're just beating ourselves up for it every day. This is really, really important because obviously if we're beating ourselves up, well, we're going to do the same with everybody, right? Well, that person could be doing a better job. I sure could have done a better job. Instead of just saying, That's the, those are the choices I made at that time. You know, we don't criticize a a two-year-old for falling down or if you're learning a new language you don't criticize the early times when you 
fumble and make errors or mistakes. We're all the same, right? And it's like, and I'm not making excuses for bad behavior or anything like that. I'm not talking about not learning from our past and all that. But even learning from our past only works if we look back in love and we say, you know, I mean, I can look back at my marriage and I can think, you know, there's a lot of things I would have done differently, knowing what I know now, right? But I don't look back and say, wow, you really screwed that up. That, that I just made the choices I, ha- I could at the time. That's where I was. That's where my mind was. That's where my fears were. That's what I needed. That's what my soul wanted. That's it. It's just a, hmm, all right. I now can see that. I can understand that. Let's see what the next experience looks like. Right? It, it doesn't, we don't have to be unkind to ourselves. We don't have to criticize ourselves. We don't have to, you know, what an idiot or whatever, whatever our inner voice is saying. So now imagine we then have philia with ourselves. And I do, sorry, I want to back up a little bit and say to really extend that agape, that 100% kindness for self. Like to really choose this as a discipline. There's um in yoga we talk about sadhanas, and a sadhana is a daily exercise that we do that expands us spiritually. It's not just a something we do every day. It actually has to be a little hard. It actually has to ask something of us. It has to it has to ask us to dig deeper than we normally dig, in order to make it happen so that we expand into who we really are. And to actually have this sadhana of 100% kindness for self, that the moment that voice starts to criticize, we go, nope, we're not doing that anymore. We are safe for ourself. We are kind to ourself, 100%. That's my sadhana. You know, (laughs) It's, it's quite a discipline you know, we really have some pretty crazy voices around sometimes. So then we go to Philia and we say, imagine being your own best friend, like actually being trustworthy and safe, that you really listen to you, like literally listening to you, that if you're hurting or you're unhappy or you don't want to be there, that your best friend says, we don't have to be here. Let's go home. Right? No, you don't have to answer that. No, it's all good. You know? Like imagine always having your own back all the time. And even Eros, right? To actually have romantic love for ourselves. And it sounds kooky, right? And I'm not, not talking about masturbation and all that. I'm talking about just actually really loving who you see in the mirror like really looking at them and saying you're a really awesome person you're an awesome human like to actually say to yourself what you want someone else to say to you and it's hilarious how hard it is to receive even from ourselves <laughs> you know but this is a huge journey and when we have that within ourselves when we actually are kind because even to be kind to ourselves it kind of requires a certain humility right that yeah yeah there were times that probably could have made some different choices but I get it it's all good you know onward ho right Another thing I just want to say, and then I'm going to look at the comments. So, um, so if you do have a question that you maybe asked earlier in the chat, um, if you want to repeat it, that would be awesome. I do go back and I, I read all the chats later, which you have no idea how I love it so much. <laughs> I like it's such, it's so warm and fuzzy. Um, but.
it's such a challenge to have agape for people who drive us crazy, right? <laughs> it's sometimes hard to have agape for people we love, right? Without fixing them and doing all that stuff. But what about the people who actually drive us crazy? How do we have agape for them? So imagine instead we change the question and we say, well, let's take two scenarios. One scenario is you choose agape, even though they're mean, even though they've been nasty to you, but you choose agape. Not being a doormat, not being not without choice, not being without obligation, not none of that. Just agape, just a heartfelt love for the human. Or we don't choose agape. So what happens if we don't choose agape? Where does our brain go? So not choosing agape means no kindness, no respect. <laughs> our brain will twist on any, every single thing they've ever done for eternity. Right? We will just, and then they did this, and can you believe they did this, and da 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 And uh, it's funny, I'm reading a book right now by David Bohm all about human interaction. And he talks about how thoughts and feelings are not separate within, that they are so deeply interwoven, there's a question as to whether or not they're even separate. That when you think something, the emotions, the emotions from that story are so deeply embedded with those thoughts, you literally can recreate an experience instantly. So if we don't choose agape, and we just assume no respect, well, you know what? They're just a jerk, and they just do it, and this, and you know what else? And they just probably just did it because, oh, maybe it's me, and I'm just a jerk, and I just am not lovable, and I, you know, they don't, they don't treat so-and-so like that. And, like, it's just this, like, cacophony that goes nowhere. It only escalates and drives us crazy and gives us ulcers and indigestion. It goes nowhere, right? If we choose agape, and we look at this person and we say, they must have some reason for doing this. I don't understand it. I obviously don't have enough information. I have a friend who um, had a very abusive childhood and you know, a lot of physical abuse and drug use and um, to this day, you know, she doesn't speak with any of her sisters because um, the mom would actually pit the sisters against each other. And, uh, and it was really, 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 really horrific. And then many years later, so she was estranged from her mom for most of her adult life. And, and she herself, my friend, she also had a very difficult life even beyond growing up you know with addiction and abusive relationships and you know all that which just made her hate her mom even more and then years later you know she was probably 40 her husband got talking to her mom and found out her mom's actual story and the story was that Her mom was the eldest of three kids, and when she was young, her parents would pimp her out until basically she had her period, and then they stopped when she was 12. The police came, took her away, and her daughter, and her brother and sister, but she was so terrified. She'd never been to school. She'd never had anything. All she'd ever done was this horrible thing that her parents had done. It's a horrible story. Sorry about this. But... But the mom, the girl, was so, the 12 year old was so traumatized by adults at that time to be taken away by the police, she wouldn't speak. So at the time, they assumed that so, there was something wrong with her mentally. So she put, they put her in a mental institution and she lived there for 30 years, completely medicated. And that wasn't a good experience. And eventually, an orderly fell in love with her 
they left. They got she got out, and this became the fa- the the husband. And she had four children within five years because she had no idea how it was happening. And then the father ran away with the babysitter. And this was this was my friend's mom's story. And instantly, my mom forgave. Uh, she forgave her mom completely. Like the story was over. Every every little bit of hatred, every little bit of anger, every little bit of everything disappeared the moment she knew the truth. Right? Instantly, she had agape. Instantly, she had respect for the, how difficult her mom's life must have been. Right? And this is a really extreme story. Right? I'm, I apologize. It's disturbing. But... The question becomes, why do we have to hear the story? Why do we need to hear a good enough story to have agape? Maybe that person doesn't even know why, right? And when we choose agape, when we choose agape regardless of whether we know the story, we're at peace. God knows they don't need any more negativity coming their way. So it's an interesting thing. Like, It's not necessarily even how do you do it. It's just a choice to say, what do you want? Right? <laughs> like, and again, it doesn't mean you have to put up with bad behavior. It doesn't mean you can't speak your mind. It doesn't mean you have to hang out with people who are mean to you or anything. But we can still have agape for them. And it brings us peace and allows our minds to rest. So... Let's say you're in a relationship right now, or let's say you have children, or let's say you have a friend, or let's say you have parents, (laughs) or whoever it is you're connected with right now. Like, how do you do it? How do we go from where we are right now to that place of agape and kindness and respect and trust, right? So I'm going to use the example of an intimate relationship and just, and, you know, and again, it can be extrapolated to all, all relationships. The first thing is, like, if you're in a relationship with someone, both people actually have to want it. Both people have to actually want that level of connection. Because if they don't, that's it. We're done. <laughs> Right? Because then it's not even agape to make them try. Right? They don't want it. It's so, right? So let's now assume that they do want it. Let's assume that both people really want to have this connection and figure it out. The second thing we really need is, is conscious awareness. Like actually to be aware of what's going on. And this is a big deal. Like those are easy words to say, but... It really means that we're willing to kind of, something happens and the other person goes, hey, that kind of, that kind of stung. And the other person go, instead of going, oh, <laughs> right? instead of getting defensive or angry, that the other person actually goes, did it? Oh, okay. Okay, well, hold on. I got to look at that. Wow. I didn't even know. I don't even know where that came from. Maybe that's, did my dad sound like that? You know, and you actually get to have a conversation in conscious awareness that you're both kind of having your witness minds present, looking at each other going, hmm, yeah, that wasn't right. I, I, my intention isn't to be mean, so, okay, let's explore that. Right? We don't have to be perfect, but we at least both want to be consciously aware of what's going on so that we can have a conversation and grow together. Right? And again, this can even be between parents and children, right? That's a huge, huge deal because sometimes we have a lot of history. And we have a lot of history based on where we were at at the time. And imagine you come to a child or you come to your partner and you say, can we start over? I know we've been doing this for decades, but I think there's another way. And I just want to just try some stuff out. And I think we have some bad habits. And I think we can just, there's stuff we can do. But I know that I might need to be kind of more aware, and we all need to be kind of more aware. 
but I really, this is really important to me because you really matter to me. And I really want to feel that love with you. So it just might take a bit, right? So we need to have that awareness. And the next thing I want to say, and it sounds a little, a little bitchy, <laughs> but there's a level of maturity required for this. <laughs> Because, and it's so weird, like it's weird how the idea of growth and maturity is sometimes considered a bad thing. Like it's like this, like, you know, oh, aren't they mature or something, right? It's like, I don't know, it's like some weird whispers in our soul that says being a rebel is the best, man. <laughs> like, instead of just actually kind of having, and, and what is maturity, really? right? It's experience. It's, it's time on the planet. It's observing many, many, many different experiences over time. And coming to a place where you go, yeah, I know where this road goes. I don't like it. Let's make a different choice. All right. And if someone says to you, like, I do not like, I don't like criticism at all. Like, <laughs> in the land of in the land of things I struggle with, I'm not really good with criticism, so I'm not saying everybody should be. But every so often, I get my comeuppance, and somebody will call me out on something, and I gotta put my big girl panties on. <laughs> I've gotta go. Okay, that hurt, but I'm listening. <laughs> and again, said in love, all that kind of thing, right? But it's okay. It's okay to be corrected, you know. <laughs> Sometimes it's my kids that do it the most, right? It, they kind of just look at me, and I'll just sort of be spinning in backwards, you know, and they'll be looking at me, and they'll go, hmm, that's interesting, Mom. Not sure where you're getting any of this from. <laughs> Look at the hilarious. And the next one is responsibility. To actually realize to be responsible. To really say, you know, I'll own this. I, I'm responsible. I'm going to take care of this. I've said I'm going to do this. And I'm going to. And I'm going to take responsibility for that. Again, these are funny things that for some reason, it's like we've been told that, no, I don't want to have to be responsible. I want to be able to just let my hair down and just do what I want. And I, I shouldn't have to think about things and overthink so much. And I don't want to do that. And which is always so weird to me because I think, again, there's seven and a half billion people on the planet. And you chose this one person or many if you're polyamorous, but you chose this person or these few people <laughs> to be you're number one. Why would we do anything but bring our A game? Like, shouldn't that person get the very, very, very best of us? Like, isn't it weird sometimes that our family and our partner gets the worst of us? And then someone comes to the door, a complete stranger, and they get the best of us? Like, it's so backwards so so odd and the last thing is really having a sense of integrity that everybody really has to have integrity that says if I say I'm gonna do this I really mean it which means I'm not going to agree to something I have no intention of falling through on and I genuinely I'm all in and integrity sounds like sort of a aloof kind of person of integrity idea, but it just simply means that if I say it, I mean it. And that's it. And this is really important because we often talk about finding safety in relationships. What do we do if we haven't had safety in the past? all that kind of thing. And again, the number one thing is to start with us and to make sure that we have integrity ourselves. 
that we have agape for ourselves. We have philia for ourselves. We love ourselves. And when we hold that integrity for us, nothing else is possible in relationships. Intimate relationships, parental child relationships, friendships, it's almost just like nothing else is possible. Like I remember when my, when my kids were little, and I would say, okay, we're going to clean the rooms today. And, I, and the kids would be arguing or they'd be like, no, no. You know? And I wasn't a commandant mom by any means, right? If I said, you know, let's clean the rooms, it, they really needed them. <laughs> it was important. And I remember just looking at them the first time. Again, like when I really went through this journey myself, like when they were younger and I had my own healing crisis and really, really had to come to myself. And we're just looking at them and thinking, we're not having conversation. <laughs> like, we're cleaning our rooms. <laughs> it's just what's happening. And it's so interesting to kind of just stand there in your truth. And they kind of look at you and they go, oh, so oh, we're just doing it. Oh. <laughs> and, and it's a weird example to say about children, but it's the same thing in relationships. When we simply stand in our integrity and we're kind and loving and honest and we have our own back, there's actually no other way to interact with us. There's, there's just, there is nothing else. There's no, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, and we actually expect that of everyone around us. And, any, and anything less than that, we go, what are you doing? Why, why are you acting like that? That doesn't make any sense, right? Thank you so much for being here. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you again. We'll see you soon.